uh, dear friends, we're here today to discuss uh, Ambassador Fabian's book, The Arab Spring That Was and Wasn't. I think the title has been specially chosen to intrigue us all, you know, and uh, to make us think about why it was and why it wasn't. Um, and uh, before I hand over to Ambassador Fabian, whom I'll request to tell us in his own words what impelled him to write this book and what was his motivation, uh, I'd like to introduce the three panelists. Uh, basically, Ambassador Fabian was in the Indian Foreign Service from 1964 to 2000. He served in several countries, including Madagascar, Austria, Iran, Sri Lanka, and uh, I'm missing one, sir. Qatar. Qatar, yeah. And, too many. Huh? I said I have served in too many stations. <laughs> too many stations. He was the first secretary in Iran during the Iranian revolution, which must have been a very exciting experience. And we're hoping that we will talk about that a little uh, during our conversation. Multilaterally, he's dealt with uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency and UNIDO, which incidentally, sir, so did I when I was in Vienna. He's been JS Gulf, and he was himself personally involved in the evacuation of 1,766,000 1 Indians from Kuwait and Iraq, the largest civilian evacuation uh, which was ever done by air, you know. And uh, he's currently not a professor in JNU. He's served as a professor in JNU in Delhi, um, Mahatma Gandhi University in Kottayam, Symbiosis in Pune, and is currently the professor of the Society of International Law in uh, Delhi. I turn now to Nina Gopal, my very good friend. Uh, she is, as you all heard, a journalist. She began in Bangalore first, and then moved to the Gulf in the 1980s, and was the foreign editor of the Daily Gulf News. Uh, she traveled through the Middle East uh, during and after the first Gulf War in 1990 and then the second Gulf War in 2003. She's also been a great contributor to neighborhood analysis, the countries in our neighborhood. She's interviewed the top leaders in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Afghanistan. And she has written a very interesting book called The Assassination of Rajiv Gandhi because she was actually there when it happened. Uh, and as for myself, my own experience with Arab countries was when I was Secretary East in the Foreign Ministry. And I had the responsibility for the bilateral relations with all 22 Arab countries. Uh, also with, uh, for the relationship with Israel and Palestine, which as you can imagine was not easy. Um, later, I, I also dealt with Hajj and had to negotiate the Hajj quota every year uh, in I Saudi Arabia. That. Yes, we all did that. <laughs> and then later as the Deputy National Security Advisor, I dealt with the fallout of the failed Arab Spring, as I chose to put it. And I have personally visited Egypt and Syria, Tunisia and Morocco uh, at different times and uh, before the Arab Spring. And frankly, I've been appalled at the wanton destruction that has taken place in many of these countries and particularly the destruction of the secular uh, infrastructure that existed in these countries and the advent of the Islamic State through terror groups in these countries. Uh, I personally was involved also in an evacuation, though on a much smaller scale than Ambassador uh, Fabian's, because I had to handle the evacuation of 16,000 Indians from Libya at the height of the crisis. It was quite a task. So I can imagine taking out 176,000 was even worse, because they also had long road journeys. Uh, to contend with, but uh, I can tell you that these evacuation operations are not easy. And unlike what you see in movies like Airlift, I can tell you that uh, the Indian Embassy really does everything possible to assist Indians uh, overseas. 
uh, whereas it was made out in many narratives that uh, the Indian embassy is very passive and doesn't do anything. To give you an example, in Libya, our ambassador, who was a woman, stayed in spite of the fact that there was active shooting going on and there were bullet it? holes, money make a lie. And she got an award for it. And they were actually a shoot, shooting going on on the residence. And she had to take refuge under a table to avoid being shot herself. So, you know, there there is something to be said for the role of the uh, foreign service as well. In Kuwait, I think it's Mr. Badr Kumar went in. Yes. And, uh, and in Iraq, uh, Ramesh, my, and, my batchmate yes. A. Ramesh, mm. he stayed right through. Uh, the ambassador was already in India and couldn't come back. So Ramesh, as charge uh, uh, affairs, had to handle that. And they put up with months of bombing, mm. you know, and it was very, very difficult for them. They sent away their children, but he and his wife stayed throughout, ran an open house for all the Indians who were in distress. And uh, it was quite a job, you know. So anyway, getting back to Ambassador Fabian's book, it's very interesting because while I don't propose to go country by country, because I'm sure Nina will have many questions to ask country-wise, uh, the question is, uh, what impelled the Arab Spring? and? Uh, why was it considered at least partially a failure? It exists and does not exist. As Ambassador Fabian himself says in his book, it's dead and buried in Egypt. It survived in Tunisia. It's active in Algeria and Sudan now. It's dead and buried in Bahrain. It's reviving in Libya and in distress, in severe distress in Yemen. I think the, the events which began in December 2010 in Tunisia and the last, I would say, major events have been in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, sir. Mm -hmm. Though the repercussions are being felt till uh, today. Uh, you know, you've had Tunisia, you've had Yemen, you've had... Mm -hmm. Uh, Mubarak in Egypt uh, uh, falling from power and now most recently you had uh, Botafrika in uh, uh, Algeria and Al-Bashir in Sudan. The wellsprings and trajectories of the Arab Spring are needed to be traced and I think that's what he's done in his book. Why did it fail overall? the role that was played by external powers. This, for me, was a very interesting part of the book. And both the very real as well as the very insincere efforts to end the civil wars. Uh, and whatever initiatives the UN took, why did they fail, you know, to, to resolve these uh, issues? So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Nina. And uh, Nina, uh, sorry, first, Ambassador Fabian, my my mistake, uh, so that you can tell us about what made you write this book and what was the motivation. Thank you, dear colleague and friend. Uh, well, surrounded as I am with uh, two brilliant minds, I should say that uh, I'm speechless. Dear book lovers, and I'm so glad to see my friend from Rome. Long time ago, but it's always good to meet old friends and make new friends. Now, coming to the book, uh, why did I write it? Did you say that? Yes. Well, why did I write it is said in the dedication. You know, it is dedicated to the... <coughs> hundreds of thousands of human beings, some of whom found a watery grave while they tried to escape, you know, in the Mediterranean. And so many millions displaced otherwise. So it is dedicated to them as well as to those NGOs, you know, who try to do good. 
that is Médecins Sans Frontières and others. But before that, let me say how happy I am to be back at BIC. Um, I had, uh, I don't know whether it was this building or another building. I think it must have been the 10th building. Yeah, where my another book, uh, Diplomacy Indian Style. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Ambassador Letha, for that uh, very sweet introduction. Uh, it is a study in uh, giving flowers with words. <laughs> and we have known each other for quite a while. I used to harass poor Ambassador Fabian when he was the ambassador in Doha. <laughs> I never felt harassed. <laughs> <laughs> and if that is what you mean by harassing, continue. <laughs> now, you ask the question, why did it happen? Well, it's like this, you know. Over a period of time, that part of the Arab world we are dealing with, this is not the entire Arab world, but that part of the Arab world we are dealing with, it had not known democracy. I'll come to the question why. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, what shall I say, uh, gunpowder, you know, getting accumulated. And then somebody has a mastic, then it blows up. Now, let me try to put it in context. <laughs> if you take uh, Tunisia, where it all started. That uh, man, uh, <clears throat> Bouassisi, about whose name you were telling me. Yes. So I will leave that to you. But uh, you see, he was not starving, but he felt humiliated. And there was a you know, lack of freedom and dignity. In fact, uh, the Arab, uh, at any time you can ask me to stop. Eh? because otherwise I will go on. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, they wanted to call it a dignity revolution, not Arab Spring. That name was given by Professor Mark Lynch of George Washington University, yeah. who incidentally, being a good American scholar, believes that the international system corresponds to the solar system with the United States at the center. <laughs> And, you know, other sort of, you know. In fact, he called it uh, Obama's Arab Spring. Can you imagine? Now, apart from that, he also had another thought in mind. As we know, the 1848 revolutions in Europe, well, springtide na of nations, that lasted just one year. And uh, the rulers promised so many reforms, but then the boats came. And everything was sort of, you know, restored. You know, Metternich had run away and all that sort of thing, you know. So, that is, so in other words, he hoped that, you know, when Tunisia it started, it's okay, the old order will continue. In fact, what is interesting is that uh, uh, even in Egypt, uh, 17th of uh, uh, January, the BBC reported there are some problems in uh, Tunisia, but you know, Mubarak is safe. Now that is what I call wish becoming father to thought. I as a West like to see Mubarak continue because it's easier to deal with one man whom I can please, whom I can threaten, rather than with, you know, this chaotic, democratic, changing governments and all that, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, now coming to the title also, I was uh, in Cairo and uh, our ambassador Navdeep Suri had invited me for lunch and there were two Egyptian ladies sitting on either side and uh, they asked me, why are you writing this book? Why, why do you call it Arab Spring? Isn't it Arab Winter? and all that. I had not decided on the title. But the ladies insisted. Then uh, I thought of Jane logic. This room is hot. This, ro this room is not hot. 
this room is hot and indescribable, you can make seven statements. You see? So that's why I chose the other spring that was and wasn't. Because it was there. You see? So that is what happened. Now, about Tunisia. Well, when I wrote, I had said, you know, it was not too bad. But now it's a very pathetic case. As you know, the president who was elected democratically he was an independent candidate. He has uh, uh, dissolved the parliament, um, took all the powers, and then he had an election, and 11%, I believe, voted. That's right. Can you imagine a parliament with 11% voting? So that is where it is. Now, in the case of Egypt, I should say that, uh, you know, when it, uh, when from the, um, Tahrir Square, you know, when, um, because of the thunder there, when, or I thought that then, when uh, Mubarak left, I recalled to myself, you know, the immortal words of uh, Wordsworth, written when he was 19 in Paris at the time of the French Revolution. O oh, pleasant exercise of hope and joy, for great were the auxiliaries which then stood upon our side. We who were strong in love, bliss was sit in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. At that time I thought, you know, it was, you know, a real new beginning. But that was a mistake because Mubarak left not only because of the thunder from the Tahrir Square, but he was actually invited, quote unquote, to leave by SCAF, the armed forces, you know, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. Because it is supposed to meet only with the president uh, chairing it, but they met without him. <laughs> and they were also worried that he was um, wanting to have his son mm. as president and uh, the Egyptian military cannot think of anyone as president who is not in uniform. And then of course, in fact, uh, when Mubarak left, uh, the military had no business according to the constitution to take over power. It was a coup. In fact, that is my you know, s uh, smallest chapter. It was a coup because the, either the vice president or the prime minister or even speaker, I mean, there is a list, should have taken over. But then, you know, uh, but nobody noticed that. Nobody said anything. And then, of course, the military sort of uh, played a game with the Muslim Brotherhood. I won't go into it, but they outwitted the Muslim Brotherhood, you know. And then, of course, they kidnapped Morsi, the legally elected president, you know, that sort of thing, you know. So that is what happened in... Uh, Egypt, and if I may say a word about Libya, well, what happened in Libya is that uh, Gaddafi was prepared to leave so long as he could get an honorable exit. Reuters re reported that sometime in March 2011. But a man called Sarkozy, yeah, great story. he had taken up to 50 million euro from Gaddafi for his 2007 presidential election. See, what happened was that Sarkozy was a minister and he went to uh, Tripoli. Initially, he had a meeting with uh, Gaddafi, the tent, you know, he always has his meetings in the tent. Well, suddenly, Gaddafi said, the meeting is over. Official part is over. Now we are going to have a one-to-one. -one. So the only other person was the interpreter in the French embassy. And later when the ambassador, French ambassador asked her what happened, she said, my lips are sealed. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, you know, in the book you will see uh, proof of uh, Gaddafi's orders asking somebody to give up to 50 million euro to our friend. It's there. You see, so now, 
what happened is that, um, you know, because uh, he did it. May I just ask a question about Sarkozy? Yeah, sure, sure. You know, you also say in your book mm -hmm. that uh, Sarkozy ordered the uh, the the uh, assassination. I mean, mm. he got Col mm. Colonel Gaddafi mm. assassinated mm. through a French Secret Service agent. Mm. I don't think I've ever read anything about this in any paper. Okay. I I I mean, I think that's the story of the uh, you know which which would make front page headlines. Mm. Fact that Sarkozy took money. And then when he became president, he mm. ordered, uh, you know, that they eliminate mm. uh, Gaddafi. Mm. And of course, you also bring in Zardari, my good friend, mm. Asif Ali Zardari. You <laughs> say that he was he was paid <laughs> till 2010. <laughs> he was given over yeah. the, uh, the, what were they, helicopters or? Uh, no, no, submarine, sub submarines. Submarines, yes, Agosta submarines. Yeah. Fantastic story. <laughs> but there is actually, sir, a... Uh, 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 investigation going on against Sarkozy till today. That's right. On this question of receiving really? foreign funding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's going on in France. Yeah. I yeah. mean, going through the various processes, yeah. but yeah. he's not been absolved of this. Mm. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a breaking story. Mm. In fact, he wanted to contest last time. He couldn't. Yes. Now, I just want to give an explanation as to why Sarkozy did what he did. You see, as a matter of fact, uh, um, you know, Gaddafi is supposed to have made a phone call to Bashar al-Assad. Now, if you make a phone call, somebody can know where you are. Mm. Okay? Now, explanation. Oh, that's how they tracked him. Yeah. Now, the explanation. This is from another Frenchman, François de la Rochefoucauld, 1613-1618. Nearly everyone is pleased to acknowledge a small debt. Many are grateful in acknowledging a moderate one. But there is hardly a man who does not, for a really great indebtedness, return ingratitude. So that is what happened. Well, <laughs> so now... Also about Libya, the British uh, House of Commons uh, Foreign Affairs Committee had come to the conclusion that it was wrong thing, what they did. NATO intervention was most disastrous. The so-called uh, R2P, that is uh, responsibility to protect, protect. which, I you know, they, they, they did that after the Rwanda massacre, when they did nothing. You know, then Canada took the initiative and all that, you know. So maybe we should move to Syria. Or should I stop here? Yeah. No, I, hmm. I would just like to inter interject here, sir, sure. that, you know, the terms Arab Spring is an amorphous one, you know, as, as is, in fact, the Arab world, you know, because I think uh, it, even the pr former VP of uh, Vice President of India, Hamid Ansari, said that in his uh, introduction forward to your book. Uh, the Gulf countries what I call the Maghreb countries, and which is essentially uh, Lebanon, Palestine, uh, Iraq, Syria, and the others in the region, uh, and the North African. North African countries are three very distinct uh, parts of the Arab world. And I think to lump them all together under this amorphous title of the Arab world or what happened in each of these countries under the title of Arab Spring is, is really not, uh, not the correct way to analyze the situation. And that's why I think the way Ambassador Fabian's done it, country-wise, is uh, far more accurate because then you get an idea of what happened in which country. You know? So I just wanted to add that, sir, but please do go on to talk about what happened. Okay. Yeah, in Syria, you know, when Bashar al-Assad came yes. to power in 2000, there were expectations that he would take the country towards more freedoms. But somehow it didn't happen. And uh, then, you know, in a school, some boys wrote on the wall, hey, doctor, it's time for you to go, in Arabic. And then the principal 
talked to so many boys. Boys were, I mean, arrested. Some of them were tortured and all that, you know. And then, you know, it just grew up. In fact, I personally think uh, Bashar al-Assad had a chance to talk to uh, the Syrians and, you know, sort of uh, 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 bring it under control. Yeah, he didn't do it, and then external forces invo got involved. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others and others, you know. Once the external forces get involved, it becomes difficult. And, uh, of course, Iran and uh, uh, Russia came to his support, otherwise he would have fallen, you know. And then Obama messed it up. He announced his red lines. And if my red lines are crossed, there will be consequences. But the red lines were crossed. The chemical attack did take place, and Obama issued orders, and the Pentagon had got everything ready. Then he had second thoughts. Now, that reminds me, when I was in Finland, the Finnish president told me that, you see, the situation in Finland is that the president will come to you for dinner, either before the state visit or after the state visit. But uh, my wife and I decided it's better to call him before the state visit, because you never know what might happen. <laughs> so he came, and uh, the Finnish system is that, you know, if he's sitting there, the ministers will not come and sit with him. The host has to sit with him. So then he said, uh, after dinner, well, order, counter-order, disorder. And he repeated. Now, that is what happened with Obama's policy. They spent $500 million to train, uh, uh, you know, good Syrians mm. to fight uh, Bashar al-Assad. I think they got uh, trained uh, less than half, a, uh, less than a dozen. <laughs> so, you know, American policy was awful. <laughs> anyway, and we don't know how many Syrians have been killed. Because, you know, when it comes to the South or the Third World, there is no counting. Americans will look for the bones of a dead American 40 years later, 50 years later. It counts. But when it comes to the so-called third world, or the south, hmm, you see? So that is Syria, though now, of course, uh, Bashar al-Assad is in a comparatively strong position. But still, uh, the economic situation is really bad. I mean, a good friend of mine who is in the foreign service there, he said that um, they are not getting paid much, you know, and the electricity and all that. So, and as Ambassador Leta said, you know, there are insincere attempts at reconciliation. Insincere. Only the United Nations acted sincerely. But then the problem is this, you know, the Secretary General's um, special representative, they are all very competent. But frankly, between you and me, you can take a horse to water, but can you make a drink? So unless the belligerents want to find a way out, you know, there's no point in the UN trying to do this and that, you know. So, now, just a word about Yemen, you know. That was, you know, sort of uh, the lucky Yemen, they used to call it in ancient times. And at that time, Arabia, Deserta, that was what is now Saudi Arabia, you know. Um, now, Yemen, uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't want democracy anywhere in that part of the world. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, um, that man, uh, he didn't want to leave at all, but finally he left. Ali Abdullah Saleh. Yeah, Saleh, and uh, he has been the longest, you know. He was in uh, north and then the south. The, yeah, yeah, and uh, in fact, I was joined Secretary Gulf when they got united, and one of the ambassadors just left, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Anyway, um, then the, you know, his deputy took over. There was an election. But uh, his deputy escaped to Saudi Arabia, and almost that day, a young man called MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, 
he was not uh, uh, crown prince then, he was defense minister, something like that, and he started the war. And they are actually chasing the mirage. Saudi Arabia will not be able to sort of, you know, militarily gain over the Houthis. And the Houthis have drones and other things, you know. So let's hope, you know, there will be an end to it, but we don't know. Now, I'll just uh, mention two things. One is that um, there is a belief that, uh, among some people, that Islam and democracy cannot go together. They're incompatible. Great uh, authors like Huntington, uh, Fukuyama, and Bernard Lewis, they have said that, you know. But frankly, I'm not sure. Indonesia is a big Muslim country, Malaysia too. And, uh, you know, if you look at Palestine, in Gaza, Hamas did win the election and then they suffocated them by denying funds. In fact, the West has stood in the way of democracy coming into that part of the world. Egypt, 1881, they were going to have a constitutional monarchy, Colonel Urabi. But London resorted to gunboat diplomacy and Urabi was sent to uh, Ceylon and he died there. Then of course, we all know about 1953, in uh, Iran. So, West just stood in the way. And uh, what next? It's difficult to say what will happen. I wouldn't say it has been a failure in the sense that, you know, was French Revolution a failure because uh, Napoleon came into power? No, the ideas of the French Revolution spread, you know. So, this way, it is too soon to write the obituary of it. But now, let me stop here so that, you know, we shall have more interesting interventions. Nina? I think he's covered yours. everything. <laughs> no, Ambassador, I basically want to say that, uh, that it is wonderful because, you know, we're only a handful of journalists who, uh, you know, got to cover the Gulf and the Arab world. Uh, so it's a great privilege to hear, you know, and it sort of reminds me of my career there at that point. You know, when we used to traverse the Gulf without even thinking twice, pack, bag, travel, you know, wars, battles. But, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that you saw the Iranian revolution, you know, firsthand in 1979. What was it actually like? Because, you know, we weren't even, it was it was just pictures for all of us, right? I mean, we just saw it in uh, Khomeini arriving and the Shah of Iran uh, escaping to France what was it like? And the was this your first posting or one of your first postings? It was my second posting. Oh, oh was it? No, third posting. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I was first secretary there. Thank you. My apologies. <laughs> I was first secretary there. I went there in 76. And the day we reached there, it was our first posting after uh, we got married. Uh, Usha, my wife and I went for cocktails to air relation of our landlord and we noticed something uh, we greeted and all that then i found a young lady standing apart so i walked up to her and asked her hi you know iranians are the politest people under the moon but she didn't respond so i said can i get you something to drink no response but suddenly she burst out I am ready to die, I am ready to kill. Now, that was a little embarrassing for me. <laughs> but still I persisted, like a dentist, pulling out. So the story is that uh, her boyfriend, a fellow student in the Tehran University, was picked up by Sawak one month ago. And she had not heard from him, and she honestly believed that they had done away with him. So, and they picked him up because they found some subversive literature in his uh, room. Against the Shah. Against the Shah. Okay, so that's what she said. That is, you know, we have to get rid of this man, Shah Shah. That is one school. Then I moved on, and one of the ladies said, oh, Mr. Fabian, we want to tell you something. Uh, uh, you know, we have a real problem. Yes, madam. Now. 
Looking at those ladies, one might have thought one were in Paris, so fashionably dressed, you know, and very well spoken, of course. So she said, you know, we have a big problem with the Shangsha. He is too kind. There are these communists and international anarchists who are creating problems. And if only he gives us the orders, we shall finish them off in 48 hours or maximum 72 hours. But he won't give us the orders. That's our problem. Now, I'll hear from these two schools of thought again and again. And what is interesting is that our hostess, you know, she had a sleeveless uh, top. And then there was a photograph of her with the Shabanu, right center of the world. But on the corner, there was a matchbox size of Khomeini. And over a period of time, I noticed two things. One is that her sleeves were getting longer and longer, and the Khomeini photograph was getting bigger and bigger. And one evening, she had full sleeves, and Khomeini photograph had replaced the Shabano photograph. And the next morning, and her uh, husband was with Sawak, eh? <laughs> next morning I saw her holding on to a rock piece. It was a big demonstration. And what happened was that, you know, there were men in white, because the shroud there is white. And they will tell you, listen, if there is going to be firing, we will take it. You know, so many lines of them. You can be safe, but we want you to run away. And she was there with a stone. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, they, there were enough indications. But when I told my ambassador that this is the beginning and the end, she didn't agree with me. He said, I saw the Shangsha yesterday. He looked very confident. So I said, sir, the royalty is trained to look confident. Whatever be the problems here. And so we shouldn't go by that. But you know, the belief that incumbency is permanent. Permanent. Well. So today's Iran has also got this undercurrent, which is in reverse <coughs> now. I mean, after this uh, girl, Masa Amini, was, uh, you know, arrested in, and died in custody. Now there's a, a movement that is pro-freedom. <coughs> and is that was, I mean, to me, it, it was very unexpected because all my Iranian colleagues, in fact, even my Iranian classmates here in Mount Carmel, <coughs> wore the hijab even before the, uh, uh, the revolution in 77, 78, before the revolution in 79, they were all wearing the hijab. So now today's Iran is, uh, is fascinating because I feel that the whole, they, they don't have the power to, uh, you know, to, uh, I suppose, stop Ali Khamenei, uh, you know, because Ali Khamenei apparently wants to bring his son in and, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> the son, son story. And uh, But how powerful do you think this movement is, or is it just going to die out? It'll be another Arab Spring that was. Would Secretary you say, like to say something first? Then I'll follow. You know, I've been to Iran several times. Uh, and uh, while it was not a pleasant experience, because I don't like being forced to cover my head. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, it's a very strange country in many ways because there are parts of Iran particularly which are not Tehran where women enjoy a great deal of freedom. I've seen girls with just a barely a headscarf, you know, with the hair showing and everything, riding pillion on a scooter with their boyfriend. Uh, I've seen couples holding hands on the street again. Uh, but that's outside of Tehran. Tehran is where they really implement it very strictly. I've seen that Iranian diplomats, for instance, I've got a very strict rule that they won't shake hands with you or touch you if you're a woman. And, uh, you know, it leads to embarrassing situations at times because you automatically extend your hand and the man leaps back like a frightened gazelle, you know, and puts his hand on his heart and bows. And you feel like a complete idiot, you know. So I think the... The, the fact is, it's a very strange mixture where there's some amount of freedom, a great deal of repression, and people are very scared of each other. 
you know, they feel somebody spying on them. And it's a very strange situation where you go into a, uh, into a meeting and there's not one person there who's not a man. Mm. Uh, you know, but at the same time, I must say the same was true of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. yeah. And they actually, actually, when I accompanied Prime Minister, the Prime Minister then, Manmohan Singh, to Saudi Arabia, they had to pass a firman to say that I am not required to wear the abaya because the foreign ministry was told their foreign ministry was told that, look, it's an insult. You can't ask my secretary East to not attend meetings because she's a woman or to veil herself or to wear the abaya. And they actually passed an edict to that effect. You're but lucky. even so, I didn't take advantage of it in terms of uh, go out anywhere on my own. In any case, the program was so packed, I couldn't. So this is the odd thing about these countries. You know, you have highly educated women, you have liberal thinkers, you have uh, movements going on side by side. The question finally is politically who will prevail? So I think it's hard to predict how this movement is going to go in, uh, in Iran. It depends on if a charismatic leader comes forward who can really mount a challenge to the mullahs. You know, uh, and whether or not the general population will follow. The other thing I wanted to mention is in countries like Turkey uh, and other countries, uh, you know, sometimes change has been forced too soon. Like what Nina was saying, that her classmates at Mount Carmel wore hijab, even when it was not required by the Shah. The same way in Turkey, a lot of women resented that they were the ability to wear a hijab was taken away from them. You know, they, they didn't want to be that modern. So I think these are the various cross currents that keep going on in societies, and which is why, in my opinion, the best societies are those where women are given the freedom to choose whether to veil, not to veil, uh, whether to work, not to work, you know, whether to vote, not to vote. You know, they should have all avenues open to them. But obviously the people in charge of the political system will finally determine what so measure of freedom. A, is there a group maybe from abroad which is stoking the, uh, the well, controversy yes. in, uh, in Tehran? So if you don't mind, I'm going to say Please. something here, you know, that I think for me, the West, meaning US and Europe have been the real enemy of true democracy uh, in the world, because in the mm -hmm. Arab world, and I would say in the world overall, because the West continues to support autocrats, monarchies, dictators, wherever it suits their purpose. Uh, and the monarchies of the Gulf, you know, which are among the most repressive, if you look at Kuwait, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, so on. And uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE themselves have quelled many uh, democratic movements. So you've got a pincer effect, you know, where Saudi Arabia and UAE, because of their huge economic power, uh, and the West because of its influence and influence operations, like on social media, etc. Between them, they effectively kill off a democratic movement before it's even properly begun. Uh, and where it suits them. Where it doesn't suit them, then, you know, right to protect, uh, fostering democracy, etc., etc., comes up when they want to topple a Gaddafi or a Saddam Hussein. So, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very hypocritical system, in my why opinion. Did, why did the West pull the plug on Saddam Hussein? Well, I think we should ask Ambassador because Fabian I know, that. I know the, I mean, the most celebrated uh, interview that ever went out was the actual recording of April Gillespie, yeah. uh, the in US ambassador to Iraq, who basically did sort of gave him a signal that he could invade Kuwait, take it over as its 19th province, yeah. uh, you know, and that America wouldn't stand in the way. And yet in 2003, when they began to, you know, uh, why, why did... George W. Bush go 
and do this. I mean, there were no chemical weapons because I know I was part of the uh, the group that was taken from one chemical factory <coughs> to another chemical factory, and the, there was nothing in those chemical factories. They were all dried up, empty, uh, you know, just just walls. So there was no chemical weapon, uh, you know, uh, weaponry at all. So why was I've always wondered why did they pull the plug on him and kill him in the manner that they did? He did their dirty work for them, sir. Yes. I'm going to give this to you. Uh, well, I wrote a book called Common Sense and War in Iraq. It was published in 2003. And uh, if you permit me, I want to tell you what happened to the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the U.S. Embassy bought so many copies, <laughs> and I don't know what they did with it, shredding or something else. And my publisher. He will send ten copies to Bangalore, saying that uh, please return the unsold copies within two weeks. You see, Somaya, he was the publisher, and his only interest to us, um, you know, Gujral, uh, you know, uh, the former prime minister, prime minister. He had written the foreword, and we had a function at uh, I think Habitat. So the publisher's son came and he had a photograph with Kujral. Now coming to your point, America wanted Saddam Hussein to invade Kuwait because America wanted a military presence in that region. They have been planning it for a long time. There is a central command in Tampa, Florida. There was a man called uh, uh, let me get his name. Uh, uh, very tall guy. He was a, a general. Uh, Shotskov. Yeah, I yeah. Isn't he tall and tall, big guy? Big guy. Yeah. Now, he became the chief of the Central Command uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And the war doctrine of the Central Command was Soviet Union will get, uh, go to the Gulf because you know, it wants oil and other things. So that was the duty, the war doctrine. Then he said, look, this is nonsense. So which union has collapsed. So he got the war doctrine changed to say that Iraq will invade Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. And then he went to the Gulf in, uh, in the spring, telling the sheikhs, Iraq is going to invade you. Not only that, he was conducting a simulation in his office. Then the real war started. Then Shotskov screamed to his staff, I'm getting confused. What's happening in the real world and what's happening in the simulation are the same. Please, put a big, in big letters, simulation. And another here, real world. Otherwise, I'm getting confused. You know, I was in Basra mm. when the Iraqis signed the instrument of surrender. Mm. And that's when I got to interview Shotskov. Mm. He actually was willing to talk to a, you know, a journalist covered with dust and mm. mud. Because mm. mm. we'd all driven from Kuwait into Basra mm. to see the actual surrender. Mm. But he was, I didn't realize he was the architect of yeah. the yeah. actual invasion. Yeah. And one more thing. You spoke about WMD. Weapons of mass uh, destruction. Yes. But the correct expansion of WMD is weapons of mass deception. Yes. Wow. Because after spending so much money, they couldn't find anything. Nothing. You know what I mean. So that is that. Now coming to Iran for a second. When I was there, youngsters used to come to me, Western educated, please give us a copy of your constitution. Because in India you have a, con uh, you, have a uh, you know, no army takeover and all that. Please give us a copy. And uh, well, we had to cycle style and gave it so many copies, you know. But what happened was that, you know, Khomeini took over and it was theological, you know what I mean. But one more point, unless the security forces refuse orders to shoot, the regime will continue. It's only when the security forces say they won't shoot. Because uh, during 76, 79, what happened was that uh, I was, uh, I've been present at many demonstrations. 
So security forces will be there. Then young Iranian women will go with one rose flower each. And they will give it to all those young men. In fact, there was hardly any shooting. There was none. You know what I mean. In fact, there was one case where I noticed, I, see, I got a call, I'll take a second. I got a call from a merchant, Armenian merchant, saying that we need to be very careful when you speak on the phone. Well, some good people are coming to your part of the city. So I said, what are the good people doing? Oh, nothing much. They set fire to cinema, show, cinema halls and foreign banks. Or oh, maybe liquor shops too. So I said, oh, they're really good people, no? Yes, of course. So then I said, how long will it take them to come? Oh, 50 minutes. So I said, thank you, I'll give you, I'll give a call back. I had some delegation from India selling uh, uh, some, something, uh, you know what I mean. So I talked to them for five minutes and then said, we'll meet again. Then I told the head of chancery, listen, our bank, they are going to destroy British Bank of the Middle East. So I want David even to go and take his money, but in a manner without giving the impression that the Indian Embassy knows something. It's very important. And I want to be action completed within 30 minutes. So he came back, then I went. So I chatted with the girls, and she asked me, what's happening, Mr. Fabian? I said, what's happening? Uh, then, you know, with one, what shall I say, flick of her eye, she asked me, Mr. Fabian, would you like an overdraft? So I said, no, I just will take whatever I have. Then I could see that she was stuffing her handbag with currency notes, and once one girl started it, other girls did it. I was looking at the watch, and uh, then I told her, I'm glad to see that you are very happy. Let's meet for coffee tomorrow. Fix the place. Then I came out, and uh, people were coming. The uh, demonstrators were coming. So this girl did this to me. For once in my life, I was uh, very unsure. I didn't want to recognize her. I looked through her because it was dangerous for me. Well, we waited. In five minutes, they came. They had Molotov cocktails and the building was gutted down, and this is very interesting. The security came after the action had been completed, and these people went to the next target. In other words, there was a secret understanding. You go and do what you want to do, but when we come, you should run away. You see, that is why, you know, there were no mass killings, yes. except in Aradhan. You know, in your book, you also mention Bahrain, which was a very interesting, uh, you know, uprising in itself. Because, you know, it was, it seemed to me every time we went to Bahrain, you know, it was always like a holiday. People looked happy. You didn't expect the Khalifas, Al Khalifas to be, uh, you know, unpopular. In fact, the king used to go to the beach. Uh, and I remember uh, the stories about him, you know, having conversations with ordinary people and how much he was loved. So where did the Bahrain uprising come from? And I think it was also the first time that, uh, I mean, to, to us who cover, didn't, who didn't even know this, that that bridge, uh, you know, that the, the, the causeway which connected Saudi Arabia to Bahrain became the place where the Saudis and the Emiratis sent troops. I mean, unheard of. I mean, it was really a shock to all of us. So, where did that Bahrain uprise? Was it was it a consequence of the Arab Spring also? Yes, in the sense that they were watching, and in Bahrain, you know, we should also take note of the Sunni Shia. Mm. It was a Sunni rule and Shia majority, and they don't take the census because they don't want to know. You know, this is also true of Yemen then. Yeah, and. Uh, then what happened was that um, Saudi Arabia, I mean, you see, the Bahrain, uh, they played, the crown prince played a game. He gave the impression that there will be concessions to gain time. And then, of course, Saudi Arabia decided that it was time to shut it down, shut it down and uh, they sent the troops. And Kosovo is where uh, the Saudis used to go 
for uh, having fun over the, over the weekend, yes. <laughs> you know, having a drink and what not, you know what I mean. Basically, Saudi Arabia doesn't want democracy anywhere in that part of the world, and they will put it down, come what may, and that's what they're trying to do in Yemen. So, you know, to come back to Yemen, uh, I, I also traveled in Yemen, went up to the Marib Dam and, you know, we were doing a story on the fact that the uh, uh, the Nahyans, the Al-Nahyans, the ruling family of Abu Dhabi, actually traced their lineage back to uh, the Marib. You know, that, that's where they originally come from. So, I was also fascinated by the fact that, the, uh, that in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the bottom level, you know, all the banks, the tellers, the uh, actual workers, and all of them were all, all Yemenis. You know, it, they were the workforce before the, uh, alongside the Indians and the Pakistanis, the Yemenis were the workforce. And then, of course, they, uh, after the first Gulf War, they all went home. And, uh, you know, and of course, the unity and disunity and all of that happened. But what what struck me the most about the Yemenis is that they were clever. They are, they are no fools. I mean, unlike the uh, Saudis who are basically fed on money. Uh, these guys live and, uh, you know, I mean, they, they struggle, but they survive. So is that a battle that the Saudis are never going to win only because uh, there's nobody to back the, Saudi, the, the Houthis except Iran? And Iran doesn't have in, uh, you know, sort of resources that can go on forever. I mean, it's a battle between Iran and Saudi Arabia, really, in Yemen. Uh, yes, and uh, no, in the sense that uh, the Houthis have their own strength. Iran is, you know, Iran can't send material. How will they send? How will they send? Well, there is a story that they're sending something through Oman, but one doubts it, you know. Yes. But I'm sure the Saudis and Americans can usually find that out, you know. So the, who, the enemies, as you said, are very intelligent. And I personally don't think uh, uh, the Saudis will be able to defeat them. And they know that. That's why they want peace. But Iran doesn't want to agree till, as you said, you know, Iran-Saudi differences are settled. There cannot be a solution in Yemen. But now there is a, you know. Sort of a lull. Yeah, sort of a you know, lull, you know. If I can intervene here, sir, so we have half an hour left. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to open it up for uh, questions from the audience. And uh, uh, if, uh, if there are no questions, then we can continue with our uh, discussion. Yes, please. Mr. Fabian, do you talk uh, about uh, charismatic leadership? Now, in our own country, we are supposed to be having a charismatic leader. So, would we be also headed the Iranian way ever? Thank you. <laughs> Shall we take a few questions? Yes, we can take a few questions. Anyone else? If not, then... Ms. Ghosh, you lived in the Gulf for long enough. I was so young too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't you go ahead, sir? Well, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> you know, what is charisma? See, charisma can be used for, good, for a good purpose or for a bad purpose. Mahatma Gandhi was charismatic. But Hitler also was charismatic. You know, when he used to speak, quite often, Rich women used to take out their ornaments and give it. So charisma can be used for a good purpose or a bad purpose, but, but, it also depends on the people. If you want to be brainwashed, you can be. But if you don't want to be brainwashed, nobody can brainwash you. Now, as far as India is concerned, I don't think uh, Indians like to or want to be brainwashed. And therefore, I doubt whether we might go in that way. But uh, democracy implies an intelligent electorate. And that we should never forget. 
And now there is a tendency to say that, you know, it's a presidential system, if you noticed. Vote for X as Prime Minister, vote for Y as Prime Minister. This is wrong because we are not electing a Prime Minister. We are electing that particular candidate. If the candidate is good in your view, vote for that person. If the candidate is not good, don't vote. In fact, I am told in Himachal what happened, according to a friend of mine who was in the IB, retired. He spent a couple of days there before the election. He said uh, Congress has a chance. Uh, so I said, isn't there bickering in the Congress? Yes, there's a lot of bickering. They are not very well organized. But there is a new trend now. The voter wants to vote for the candidate without looking at the party. If the particular candidate has a good reputation, he or she gets the vote. And then he predicted the victory for uh, Congress from that point of view. Now, this may not be a, what shall I say, um, a mathematically correct argument, but there is something in what he said, something. Is it okay? I worked for the state government for about 18 years. Then I quit and I worked in Middle East, Saudi Arabia for about eight years in private sector. So I had a very, it's a more anecdotal because I don't, Mr. Hamid Ansari was the ambassador mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi. What I find is why Saudi Arabia doesn't want democracy around, mm. basically because of the ruling family, mm. they want to hold on to power at anything. Mm. But when I interacted with uh, educated people, engineers and other things, mm. many of them didn't own a credit card. Mm or I think their debit card wasn't there at that time, mm. there. And when I asked them why, mm. they said, no, we don't want the government to know, you know, to keep track of our spendings and other things. Mm. So what I felt was, if you, as a journalist, you might have seen the Arab news. It was fairly, you know, a good uh, newspaper. I don't know, because I left uh, in uh, 2002, I left uh, Saudi. <coughs> so what I found was that there is no critical mass mm. there in Saudi Arabia, population-wise. Though the Arab population, which used to come, the more educated one, used to come to Bombay and these parts of the world for their English education, are now, many of them are going to USA and UK. There is a shift. So obviously there, will, there is, uh, you know, the, the freedom, the liberty and other things, I think they are imbibing it, but they don't have a, the critical mass. If the powers, like earlier the Pakistani uh, troops were there to safeguard them, mm. uh, then you have the USA there with their, the minute the Western power, particularly USA, you know, just withdraws or whatever it is, the regime will collapse in no time. I don't know what will come out of it. Maybe you may get another Khomeini there because always a reaction. You know, we don't know. So this is my thing. Regarding the polarization which is happening in our country, I can tell you a personal example. It is really bad. As a Muslim, I know. I can feel it, it's palpable, and it is said. In 1982, I was a petty bureaucrat. I was given a very unpopular job of removing unauthorized constructions. So I went and demolished a mask unauthorizedly cut in uh, Austin town here. I did tell the, my friend, good friend, the ACP, Muslims by nature are very, very emotional and they become, so you should have adequate force to, you know, uh, to take care of the law and order problem. Despite my request, I waited for 
the forces to come, they sent one van, one police van. And I expected a lot of trouble. When I went, entered, <clears throat> removed the holy book and other things with the, all respect, then I, we started demolishing. Of course, the stone throwing started and all those things. This is 82, I'm telling you. So then police opened fire, then we had to face Agnihotri commission uh, inquiry. But the behavior of the police, I felt that there was no need for to open fire. Just because some people were, you know, uh, you know, bearing their chest and, you know, doing vulgar gestures, these guys opened fire. The police never realized that I am a Muslim. Mm. So what they were doing, they were using the choices words against the Muslims mm. and while protecting me, they took me inside the van. They pulled me. Now, that was the thing that they pulled me. The percentage has increased. The bureaucracy, to a large extent, the police. To, you see the day for yesterday, I think there was a report where, you know, community-wise, some survey was done, and they said 64% felt uh, Muslims are violent and criminal. Here or? Yeah, in Bangalore, there was a newspaper mm. uh, survey that, yeah. done. Mm. So the, it is really, a, you know, a worrying factor for a minority, mm. religious minority. That much I can take. Thank it's you. the largest minority in the world. I just want to, if I may, I just want to make a point about Gujarat. You see, in 2002 when it was happening, I had retired and I was in Delhi. We had the railway budget at that time. You know, the parliament was in session. And uh, I had written to the Indian Express saying that it doesn't make any sense for the Parliament of India to discuss the railway budget when Gujarat is burning. So the correct thing to do is for the government and the opposition to suspend the railway budget discussion and the government should arrange for enough flights from Delhi to Gujarat so that any member of parliament, especially members of parliament from Gujarat, can just go to the airport and take off. And that at the other end, there will be transport. And then I argued that if members of parliament are there, naturally the media will be there. And in the presence of the members of parliament and the media, will these people who are committing the atrocities, will they continue or not? Well, the Indian Express chose not to publish it. And when I later went to Gujarat, some of my IAS friends, well, they didn't want to discuss this. The moment they asked you anything about it, they just said, sorry. So there is a, what shall I say, the, there is a, what shall I say, there is a denial. Not among everyone. I mean, some people, you know, that is not good. Please. Oh. <laughs> See, in the, I've been familiar with the Arab world since the end of the 50s. And for me, Lebanon was the Switzerland of that area in those years. And for me to see what's happened to that country since, so but I haven't been back for about 50 years now. So I just thought, since you are been there currently and you're familiar with it, what is, I mean, it's really down it's the drain. Pro, so pro what pro is going to happen and what is the future of it? I thought we might like to hear from uh, Thank you. Uh, a good friend of mine, she's uh, German, but settled in uh, Beirut. She has just gone back after spending a couple of weeks in Delhi. Now, I was uh, teasing her because uh, the Lebanese currency is going down and she has suddenly become a billionaire <laughs> because she gets her money in dollars from the World Bank and the UN where she had worked. 
you know and uh, today just now i had a whatsapp from her saying that uh, there is no electricity and it is freezing the situation is bad the political class has destroyed that country and uh, people are angry but they don't have a leader there is no you know no leader coming up and uh, that and of course you know about the confessional democracy there somebody should be speaker somebody should be uh, president somebody should be prime minister you know all that is there so lebanon this is the, uh, um, the constitution which the french had uh, designed you know so lebanon is in a very bad way but lebanon has a people they are so good so clever you know but what a pity they run Like thriving businesses in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and you know they they know how to how to run a country. Why they ran their own country to the ground, I've never understood. I should also say that I was there in 2015, and an admiral had taken me to lunch somewhere. One would have thought one were in Italy, you know that sort of this thing. But then you see during the conversation, this admiral told me this Arab Spring. that was engineered by mossad and the cia now he was my host i didn't want to contradict him i merely said you know i doubt whether uh, bua sisi tarek bua sisi had any link with the cia so you got to tell us that story nobody knows that story about how he was misnamed because we we all thought he was mohammed bua sisi You see what? How did they make that error? I mean, that was the BBC. Well, not only BBC, everyone, everyone, you find it everywhere. See what happened was that uh, there was a guy called Muhammad Bouassisi, sort of an uh, IT guy. So he had his uh, uh, Facebook and other messages. And one day he said, "My dear mum, I want to take leave of you." i cannot tell you why but you will please excuse me and so on and so on and it was in a particular team which was very popular okay now the next day another boss set fire to himself so many people in the cyber world thought it was that boss now that poor man came back to cyber world saying that i am alive but nobody took him seriously so bbc and others as you saw that's a great and, story in and, itself no i got all that from this book uh, uh, this is in french and written by uh, tunisians oh. and this gives an hour to hour account of what happened in tunisia hour to hour in fact it is a, an adventitious revolution in the same that it was a series of accidents and If some of these accidents had not taken place, there would have been no revolution. If he had divorced his wife Laila, because her family was uh, stealing from the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was a hairdresser, and then he fell in love with her and married her. And uh, everybody thought. When I went to our embassy in, uh, you know, uh, there, the local staff told me, you know, Benali was not all that bad. only she was there so he even thought of uh, divorcing her and how, why did he fall because he went to the airport to see her off she was, she, he was sending her away to you know for a pilgrimage to chenda yeah well <laughs> and then his idea was that he will get back from the airport you know but then his security chief told him sir i cannot guarantee your security safety so he decided to go with her but when the flight came back without him and when he wanted to come back it couldn't happen so it was an adventitious revolution it could have happened but either way so so the rebel but there else madina yeah madina no, you know i mean the flight went to jeddah and then from there they would have gone that's a youngster Thank you, panel, for this wonderful discussion. Uh, there have been talks, or even uh, conspiracies, about how uh, Saddam Hussein, the downfall of Saddam Hussein, was because of how he um, 
uh, threatened the US and the world to uh, start trading oil in the euros. And then how Gaddafi, Gaddafi's downfall was uh, uh, hastened by how he uh, was backing uh, I don't know, centralized your uh, African currency with uh, uh, the gold standard as its uh, thing. Uh, so now, recently, the Saudi Arabian uh, def uh, defense, no, the foreign minister has threatened to uh, dump the um, age-old uh, petrodollar tradition or the agreement even. So will there be another uh, similar event? Or uh, can we see, uh, obviously not a regime change in Saudi Arabia, but uh, any effect towards the regime or any change in the um, dynamics? Well, let me put it this way. America acts as the central bank. It can print any number of dollars. No one can ask anything. As of now, as of now. If you want to send money from Bangalore to, say, uh, Jakarta, the money goes notionally via New York. You know what I mean? That is a hold of America has. Now, to my mind, as president of G20, India should do something to de-dollarize the world. You know? Now, as regards your question, whether America will try to have a change, regime change, or another sort of change in Saudi Arabia, and actually MBS, the young man is in charge. I doubt it. I doubt it. He, you know, it's easy to change the regime, but then what happens, you don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I doubt whether they will do it, but they will do what they can to resist it. But then you see, a certain degree of de-dollarization doesn't hurt them at all. You know, they also have to, you know, gradually accustom themselves to a world where dollar is, you know, less dominating. They would be afraid of uh, certain dominoes effect that one of other countries. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, you know, um, America has other clout. I mean, not only dollar clout. Hi. Huh? You don't have a word. No, I have one. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Rishabh, and first of all, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to listen to all of you. Um, I Before coming, I checked your uh, Wikipedia, and I saw that you've been ambassador to Doha. Uh, so my question is more on Qatar. And uh, it's quite interesting to me that though Qatar and Saudi are both uh, Sunni countries, but they tend to be very antagonistic. There was also blockade. Uh, and I, my family lives in Doha since 2006. So very funny that early all the milk and vegetables would come from Saudi and secondly, there was nothing. Everything had to be getting from Turkey. And this weird, uh, you know, mixing of, you know, Turkey, uh, Pakistan, Doha. Uh, what's happening there? I would love to know your take. Thank you. I was there uh, about uh, one and a half, about two years ago. There is something called the Doha Forum. You know, huge thing. Now, it's like this. Saudi Arabia considers Qatar as the younger brother who should follow the instructions of the senior. And Qatar is not prepared to do that. That's right. And uh, then there was this blockade of Qatar. As you said, things were coming from Turkey, things went from India, things went from Iran. And uh, they used to import a lot of milk. Then they started having enough cows, you know, all that. So that uh, blockading failed, you know what I mean? And uh, now Qatar is in a good, strong position vis-a-vis the other uh, GCC countries. But the undercurrent of uh, Saudi trend to look at the youngster 
Oh, what is he doing? That is still there. And one more point. You yes. What shall I say? Should be hatred for Qatar and also jealousy. The eighth emirate yeah. of the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. And then it decided it wouldn't be the eighth emirate. Yeah. And I don't think the uh, the Nahyans or the uh, anyone has forgiven them for that. <laughs> Yeah, that is there. The but Chinese continued to. Yeah, yeah. But then don't forget, yeah. even during the blockade, they used to, uh, Qatar used to supply the energy for Dubai. Yeah. That was going. Yeah. Well, you are right to an extent that is happening. But I would also say that um, there are other leaders who are, you know, sort of uh, more, uh, less extreme. Um, but we don't hear so much about them. The extremist leaders get more media space. But coming to your question of the, the future of democracy, well, I'm afraid, uh, as of now, there are clouds in the horizon. We know what happened in uh, Brazil. A president uh, gets defeated. And then he goes to Florida, and then something else happens. You know what I mean? That is in Brazil. Now you take European Union. You know the, what shall I say, the group of democracies. What's happening in Poland? What's happening in Hungary? Their democratic norms are being violated, but Brussels is not able to, you know, sort of enforce because they are busy with uh, the war in Ukraine. So you have to have, you know, unanimity, consensus and all that. So there are areas where democracy is not doing very well. So if you look at uh, uh, globally, I don't think this is the best time for democracy. But then there are democracies which are doing fairly well. Even in the European Union, apart from uh, Hungary and uh, uh, Poland, the rest are doing reasonably well. And uh, in the UK, we found uh, democracy in action with uh, prime ministers losing their job <laughs> in quick succession, isn't it? And um, again, in uh, France, Macron wants uh, you know the retirement days to be raised. And uh, there is a strong demonstration. So we can't say that, uh, all that you can say is that uh, it's clear that uh, democracy's wave is not mounting up. But in certain parts it is going down, but in other parts it's holding. Uh, did I answer your question? I think with that, uh, on that optimistic note, that <laughs> democracy will survive, uh, I think we should bring this session to a close. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Fabian and Nina Gopal for their excellent presentation. Yeah. And thank you to BIC as always. The two of you and to all of you and also to the director. And, uh, you know, in Delhi we have the Indian International Center. We always uh, look at... Uh, the Bangalore International Center with much admiration. Wow. Thank you. That's a real compliment, sir. Thank you. <laughs>